From Washington, D.C., the Department of the Army proudly presents the horn section of the United States Army Field Band. As part of an ongoing series of instructional videotapes by the United States Army Field Band, we present our horn section in a short journey through horn playing, past and present. The members of our section are Master Sergeant Dave Kirkpatrick, Master Sergeant Tom Bartolomeo, and Staff Sergeants Kathy Miller, Alan White, Pat Lippart, and Joe Levinsky. We will address some of the most frequently asked questions about our instrument and discuss some of the challenges which face horn players young and old. We will cover such aspects of horn playing as the harmonic series, right hand position, embouchure, correct breathing, practice sessions, articulation, and tone quality. One of the best ways to illustrate these objectives is to look back in time. Horn players from the earliest days used the same basic principles to produce and manipulate the sounds on their instruments as we do on ours today. Although the materials, the shapes, and the uses of the horn have changed dramatically over the years, it has always been a unique and commanding instrument. The French horn, as we know it today, is really only about 150 years old, but it is practically impossible to determine when the true ancestors of the horn were first used. Perhaps the most ancient type of horn is the horn of an animal. Hollowed out and open at both ends, we can only guess when this natural, albeit rather crude, instrument was first used. It is believed that ancient armies were led into battle by as many as 20,000 men blowing on horns like these. Perhaps, by creating such a frightful noise, they thought they could scare the enemy away. The shofar, or ram's horn, is still used in synagogues of the world to help celebrate religious holidays such as Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. These instruments were handed down from generation to generation in Jewish families. Another instrument from nature is the conch shell. In other climates and cultures, these shells were used as instruments for sending signals over long distances. With the tip of the shell cut or broken off, it makes a natural horn which produces a rich and very loud tone. These instruments from nature are, in fact, the true ancestors of all brass instruments, and they function under the same basic principles as the brass instruments we use today. As you will hear, the longer the length of tubing, or horn, or shell, the lower the fundamental pitch. From the fundamental pitch of each length, we can play different and higher notes, which are called overtones or harmonics. Regardless of the length of tubing, these notes are always in the same order. The fundamental, octave, fifth, octave, and so on. This very specific progression of notes called the harmonic series is the premise upon which all brass instruments work. Gradually, more and more horns were crafted from metal, and as the length of tubing became longer and longer, it became necessary to wrap it into coils. Utilizing the harmonic series, horn players were able to play short fanfares or horn calls. These calls were often played by one or by several horn players during the festivities of nobility. One of the most famous uses of the horn during that period was at sporting events, such as hunting expeditions. Horns like these were designed to be played while riding on horseback, and for the hunters to signal to one another, giving information about the hunt. For instance, this call meant, unleash the hounds. Since these horns were used for the entertainment of nobility, they were often crafted of silver or elaborately decorated. However, there are not nearly as many left to be admired today as must have existed at one time. During the French Revolution, such horns were considered to be a representation of the nobility, and most of them were destroyed. Even the horns that remain from that era are not in the greatest of condition, having been ridden into trees, dropped off horses, or crushed in the excitement of the hunting event. This is hardly the fate or the treatment we would think of for the expensive and beautiful instruments we use today, but we must acknowledge the nobility who built and used those instruments for recognizing and developing what has become one of the world's great musical instruments. Had it not been for the whims and fancies of those wealthy individuals, 
the word horn might still mean, as it meant then, anything from a bugle to an animal's horn to a drinking horn. Many people think that the reason our instrument is referred to as the French horn, rather than just the horn, is to differentiate it from the many other types of horns. There is actually much debate over why our instrument is called the French horn. There is significant evidence that the horn was not developed in France at all, but in Germany. Others would argue that it originated in Austria or in Vienna, and that its popularity traveled through Bohemia to the rest of the world. For this reason and others, the International Horn Society recommends that horn be recognized as the correct name for our instrument in the English language. Regardless of where it was truly developed, the skill and ability of horn players over the years seems to have increased along with the length of the horns that were built. More notes became playable as the instruments became longer and longer. Horns were built with removable lengths of tubing called crooks. Each crook made the horn play a specific fundamental pitch, which corresponded to a specific key. For example, these are the crooks in every key from the high B-flat horn, which at nine feet in length, if uncurled, is the same length as the B-flat side of our modern double horn, to the low B-flat horn, which is 18 feet long. The F horn, which is the standard length for our modern horn today, is actually 12 feet long. The composers who included these types of horns in their music wrote all the horn parts in concert pitch. Unlike the music of today, horn parts were written in the same key as the rest of the ensemble. The composer simply indicated which crook the horn player should use at the top of the music. Inserting the proper crook put the horn in the same key as the rest of the ensemble. If the composer wrote a piece which changed keys in the middle, the horn player simply held the extra crook on his arm until it was needed. The shorter crooks, which have a fairly high fundamental pitch, make playing in the high range extremely easy. Although the longer lengths of tubing make it possible to play very low notes, the sheer distance the air has to travel makes accuracy and flexibility very difficult. Over the years, many pieces of music have been written for horns of medium length, like horn and F. On a medium length horn, we have greater access to both high and low notes, as well as a greater ability to be flexible and accurate. This is one of the main reasons our double horns today are horns in F with a high B-flat horn attached. With this combination, plus a lot of practice, we are able to execute practically any technical challenge which comes our way. Up until now, virtually every note you have heard has been played on the natural harmonic series. But what about chromatic notes? What about the other notes in the scale? How were they achieved on these horns before valves were invented? This is where we find the answer to the question that horn players get asked more than any other question. Why do we put our hand in the bell? You will find that it does not take an antique horn or a special long straight horn like this one to discover the answer to this question for yourself. You can try this with your own instrument because until you use the valves, your horn is no different from these. This straight horn is 12 feet long, making it the same length as a horn in F. The harmonic series sounds the same on this horn as it does on your horn if you use no valves at all. By partially closing our hand in the bell of the horn, the pitch is altered. This makes it possible to play notes in the scale that are not included in the natural harmonic series. The sound of these stopped notes is obviously of a different quality than the sound of the open notes, but it is a challenge and a delight to great hand horn players past and present to make every note of the scale sound even and pleasant. Although with our modern horns, it is no longer necessary to use our hand in the bell to achieve all the notes in the scale, we continue to leave it there to control pitch and tone color. The best way to achieve a good hand position in the bell is to keep in mind that at any moment you may be called upon to use the palm of your hand to alter the pitch you are playing. In order to form a good hand position, relax your right hand. Place the back of your hand against the far side of the bell so that your palm is facing your stomach and so that your fingers can act as a hinge, allowing you to close your palm in the bell as much or as little as you like. In this way, we can correct small problems with intonation, making the note a little sharper as we open our hand and a little flatter as we close it down. After the horn has been tuned by adjusting the slides, almost all further adjustments can be made by moving your hand in the bell. 
Modern day composers sometimes require the horn player to produce a special sound effect called stopped horn. Just as its name implies, the hand is completely closed off in the bell, and it sounds like this. There is a mute which accomplishes the same sound, but most players simply use their hand unless it is too small to make a complete seal. This special effect is usually indicated in the music by a small plus sign over each note, or by the French word, boucher. The challenge most horn players find in playing stopped horn is that they must transpose each pitch that is written. Closing off the bell alters the pitch by a half step. Therefore, when playing stopped horn, we must transpose every note down a half step. For example, a written C in stopped horn is fingered like a B natural. The other, more common type of mute is called the straight mute. This type of mute does not alter the sound of the horn quite so radically, but it is used much more frequently by modern composers. So it was to achieve more notes and virtuosic ability that horn players first began putting their hand in the bell. Again, we must acknowledge the wealthy and the nobility for having these instruments built and for employing hornists to play them. Having great horn players in one's court orchestra in that day was considered to be a great asset and a source of pride. Symphonies and concertos were written for valveless horns well into the 19th century. Although we do not use the valveless horns in performance today, we still play many of the pieces written during that era. As composers began demanding more of horn players, instruments were created to ease the burden of carrying around crooks for every key. The first horns to have pistons were still played as hand horns, and the pistons were used only to change the length of tubing, avoiding the changing of a crook. One of the great horn players of all time was Dennis Brain. His recordings remain among the best performances of the standard horn repertoire today. Horn players still mourn the death of such a fine artist. He was very young when he was killed in a car crash in England. Who was to say how much more he would have contributed to the horn world had he lived to an old age? The instrument that Dennis Brain learned to play as a youngster was like this one, a hand horn which could be converted into a piston horn. This horn is a single B-flat horn which is the same length as the B-flat side of our modern double horns and has a lovely bright sound. There were many strange and creative contraptions that were invented over the years which attempted to deal effectively with the music that had been and was being written. With the standardization of the horn in F, there was the challenge of transposing all the music that had been written for horns in other keys over the years. This is still a cause for lament among many young horn players who try to play the same notes as their flute and piano playing friends with terrible results. One solution to this problem was the omnitonic horn, which, with the flip of a switch, was in a different key automatically. Playing the same fingerings for a C major scale each time, but changing the length of the tubing by turning these switches, the horn changes key. This design was abandoned, along with many others, in favor of the greatest transposition device of all, brain power. On today's modern horn, the valves give us great access to all the notes of the chromatic scale, and in many cases, even alternate fingerings for each note. The double horn with a horn in F and a horn in B flat should not be considered two horns for the price of one, but a four-valved instrument which gives us many options for fingering each note. Fingerings are based on the harmonic series. Pressing each valve opens the horn to a different length, which, as we have seen in the valveless horns, changes the harmonic series being used. For example, in order of length, the second valve lowers an open pitch by a half step. The first valve lowers it by another half step. The first and second valves together lower the pitch another half step. And the second and third valves together lower the pitch yet another half step. You really have 12 hand horns in your hand, if you choose to think of it that way. When you try this on your own horn, you will find that you can play the same notes on various different fingerings. For example, you can play a B flat with first valve, or you can play it open with no valves. 
The note sounds the same, but it is being played on a different length of tubing each time. As you get higher in the range, more and more notes have interchangeable fingerings, which is one of the reasons why horn playing has such a reputation for being very difficult. Having a good ear, being able to hear each note in your head before you play it, is therefore the most important skill that a horn player needs to develop. Most pieces of music are written for four horn parts, which are usually divided into two pairs. Each pair has a high horn part and a low horn part. Typically, first horn is high, second horn is low, third horn is high, and fourth horn is low. Historically speaking, this was done in order to provide two pairs of hand horns, each in a different key, allowing the composer to change key quickly without having to give the player time to change crooks. This is no longer necessary, of course, because today's horns are capable of playing in all keys and all ranges, but the tradition, like so many of the traditions we have discussed so far, has continued over the centuries. The fact that horn players have been asked to play either low parts or high parts throughout history has contributed to the idea that some players are high horn players and some are low horn players. In fact, most players tend to feel more comfortable in one or the other extremes, but everyone has to be able to play throughout the entire range of the horn, like it or not. Beginning students typically tend to avoid the very high and the very low range of the horn. In fact, the horn is unique in that it is the only single instrument that must be able to cover the entire soprano, alto, tenor, and bass range of instrumental music. You normally hear piccolo trumpets at the top of a trumpet section or a bass trombone at the bottom of a trombone section. Every horn player must use the same type of horn, yet must accomplish what is normally expected of these other specialized or auxiliary instruments. Horn players face another special challenge that is not encountered by other instruments. Our bell faces in the wrong direction. While every other instrument in the band or orchestra is pointing out toward the audience, the horn is pointing toward the back wall. This reflected sound is part of what makes the horn sound so mysterious and beautiful, but it is also the source of special challenges. The horn is the link between the brass and woodwind sections of any band or orchestra, and therefore must be able to blend with many different kinds of sounds. The extreme challenges lie in being able to play delicately and cleanly enough to balance with the woodwinds versus being able to play loudly enough to balance with the brass. The challenge of playing loudly enough tends to be of greatest concern, particularly to horn players in large concert bands. Competing with trumpets and trombones to be heard can be a futile effort. It is best not to try to overbalance these sections, since playing at extremely loud volumes distorts the sound and contributes to the forming of bad habits. Embouchures. The important thing to remember is that there is no absolute right or wrong way to form an embouchure. It is obviously preferable that we aim for the mouthpiece to be set horizontally in the middle, halfway between the corners of the mouth. This is normally not a problem for most players. Of course, such a placement of the mouthpiece takes for granted the symmetry of the teeth, jaw, and muscular structure of a person's face. The reason it is impossible to say exactly where a mouthpiece should be placed is that rarely, if ever, is a person's face perfectly symmetrical from one side to the other. The best method for placement, then, is to put the mouthpiece midway between the two corners, but let it gravitate to a place where it feels comfortable. Most textbook descriptions of vertical placement stress the proportion of two-thirds of the upper lip and one-third of the lower lip inside the mouthpiece. Most horns have a pull ring on the middle slide, which is similar in circumference to that of a mouthpiece. By pulling out this slide and using the ring as an imitation mouthpiece, it is possible to watch in the mirror what happens inside the mouthpiece as we are playing. As you form an embouchure and buzz your lips, you will see the small hole formed by the escaping air, which is called the aperture. This aperture gets larger as you play lower and smaller as you play higher. The part of playing that is impossible to see, however, is what happens inside your mouth as you buzz higher and lower. As you play higher, the back of your tongue raises as though you are pronouncing the sound E. As you play lower, the back of your tongue lowers. If you pronounce the sounds E, U, O, and ah in this order and pay attention to what happens to the back of your tongue, you will get a better idea of what should happen inside your mouth as you play higher and lower on the horn.
Controlling the airstream this way, in combination with making the aperture of your lips larger and smaller, is very similar to adjusting the nozzle on a garden hose to change the stream of water. Opening it up to its largest diameter allows the water to come out in a big spray, whereas closing it down to its smallest forces the water out in a hard, straight stream. There are basically two ways to play notes, tongued or slurred, and the music indicates the difference. Slurred notes are played with a steady, uninterrupted stream of air. However, for articulated notes, the tongue provides precision and definition to the air stream. Musically, it is the tongue which furnishes us with a virtual palette of articulations. Everything from an accentuated staccato to a legato tongue is possible. In combination with slurs and dynamics, these various types of articulations are what make a melody interesting and full of life. The technical aspects of articulation are as difficult to impose as those of mouthpiece placement. Because every individual has a different oral structure, it is impossible to dictate exactly how notes should be articulated. In general, most players begin a note by touching the tongue to a place behind the upper teeth at the gum line at the same moment that air is released into the mouthpiece. Without a mouthpiece, this release feels much the same as pronouncing the sound ta or da. Articulating notes in the various ranges follows the same principle as mentioned earlier with regard to playing higher and lower notes. As you articulate higher notes, the back of your tongue raises as though you are pronouncing the sound T or D. As you articulate lower notes, the back of your tongue lowers. Therefore, by pronouncing the sounds D, Do, Do, and Da, you can imitate what should happen inside your mouth as you articulate in the various ranges of the horn. Occasionally, horn players are called upon to tongue notes in very rapid succession. There is a technique known as double tonguing, which makes this much easier. This is a technique that must be developed slowly and worked up to a faster pace. In double tonguing, the syllables ta and ka are used in rapid succession to articulate the airstream. The ka syllable is unfamiliar at first and will tend to make the succession of articulations sound uneven. However, as with all aspects of horn playing, the more it is practiced, the better it becomes. The goal, in this case, is to achieve a clear and even succession of notes, which eventually becomes faster and faster. A common pitfall for horn players of all ages is to use a great deal of pressure when playing in the high range of the horn. Most horn players agree that some pressure is necessary in order to produce all the notes, but that too much pressure is detrimental. Using too much pressure in the high range of the horn is not only painful, but it often interferes with flexibility in moving quickly back and forth from the high to the low range. It is also one of the greatest causes for problems with endurance. When the blood supply is cut off from a portion of tissue because the mouthpiece is being pressed too firmly into it, the muscles cannot function properly. This has a direct impact on the ability of the lips to form and control the aperture. There can be a good deal of discomfort when this occurs for any extended period of time, not to mention the possibility of tissue damage. There is a standard exercise used among horn players to demonstrate just how much pressure is being used and to practice playing without it. Place the horn on a stable, flat surface. With your hands behind your back, attempt to play the natural harmonic series as high and as low as you can without pushing the horn across the table. It is true that some amount of pressure can be beneficial, but too much is definitely a detriment. It only takes practicing this exercise a few times to begin to understand and learn how to combat this common problem in horn playing. Endurance is an aspect of horn playing that eludes many performers, young and old. The ability to play as long and as well as we would like is often interrupted by discomfort and fatigue. There is no simple solution to this problem, but there are many suggestions for improvement. As with any muscle-related activity, which is exactly what horn playing is, the more the muscle is used and trained, the stronger it becomes. Therefore, regular practice is essential, not just to improve musically, but to strengthen the muscles used to produce the sound. 
By beginning with an easy and gentle warm-up each day, using scales and arpeggios up and down the harmonic series, we not only ease our muscles into use, but we review the technical elements of which almost all music is composed, scales and chordal patterns. Practicing in short intervals often helps to increase endurance. Young players should not practice for extended periods of time. 20 or 30 minute intervals are an excellent length of time to practice. Short intervals like this give both the mind and the body a chance to rest and recover from what can be very taxing work. When strengthening muscles of any kind, it is better to work in shorter concentrated intervals than to push on to the point of exhaustion in every session. To push so hard can become discouraging as fatigue lessens the ability of most players to play as they would like to. It is at this point that it becomes counterproductive to push on. A daily practice routine should incorporate a good easy warm-up, including scales and arpeggios, etudes to improve technique, solos which are challenging stylistically, and excerpts from current band or orchestra repertoire. If all of these will not fit into a 30-minute practice session, take a break and come back with a rested embouchure and a clear mind. Just as the muscles of an embouchure cannot function well without a good supply of blood, the brain cannot function well without a good supply of air. When we play with a deficiency of air, the brain's ability to concentrate and command the body is extremely limited. Not only is a steady supply of air necessary for brain power, it is the obvious vehicle upon which all sound is produced. Without it, the sound suffers greatly. Most young wind players understand that playing their instrument uses a tremendous amount of air. But what many do not realize is that they may not be using all of the air that is available to them. Comments are often made to young players about lung power and breathing from the diaphragm. The truth is that the diaphragm does not breathe and the lungs are not strong enough alone to project the air through an instrument. The lungs of an average adult hold approximately four liters of air, the same amount of air as would be contained in two empty two-liter bottles. In other words, if an average-sized adult breathed in as much as they could, they would be holding about the same amount of air as could be contained in two empty two-liter bottles. When a player takes a breath to play, Ideally, the lungs should become almost completely filled with air. However, many players do not breathe that deeply. Many take very shallow breaths, particularly if they are nervous. In order to take a full breath, it is essential to be relaxed in the shoulders, throat, and abdomen. To hold tension in any of these places decreases the amount of air that can be taken in. It is physically impossible to be tense and relaxed at the same time. The two gadgets you have just seen demonstrated are the volumetric exerciser, which is most often used in hospitals for respiratory therapy, is also useful to us as musicians for measuring lung capacity. The breath builder is a very simply designed device for teaching and learning how it feels to take in and release a large volume of air. The goal of the exercise is to keep the ball elevated at all times while using a slow, expansive breathing technique. Of course, when you play your instrument, there is more resistance so that the airstream will not flow out so quickly. But the idea of taking in and releasing a full breath like this each time is essential to good horn playing. When inhaling naturally, your chest, your abdomen, and your diaphragm expand as the air fills your lungs. The release of air in normal breathing is even easier, like letting air out of a balloon. With the help of abdominal muscles for control, breathing to play a wind instrument is no different than natural breathing. It is simply more exaggerated. It is a constant flow of air that gives support to a beautiful tone, not brute strength. If a player plays with a large supply of air, there is no need to push or strain to produce a strong and resonant sound. On the other hand, a player who does not use a lot of air must always push. Not only is this uncomfortable, but the player who plays with just enough air to get by often feels that their sound is not heard very well and consequently tries to push even harder. There are endless benefits to a player who concentrates on inhaling and exhaling fully while playing. To breathe often and well will improve almost every aspect of a horn player's technique. Endurance will increase dramatically as well as the quality of sound and the ability of the performer to focus and concentrate on the music. It is difficult to describe how to produce a beautiful tone on the horn. 
there are as many concepts of tone quality as there are horn players. Imagining the beauty of the sound before you play it can make a tremendous difference in the quality of sound you produce. Just as imagining the correct pitch before you play it will help you to play more accurately, imagining a beautiful sound will help you play more beautifully. The best way to understand the many different concepts of sound that exist is to listen to recordings of the great horn players from around the world. Just as any young athlete, dancer, or actor chooses an idol to watch and emulate, horn players young and old must listen to recordings of the great soloists, Dennis Brain, Barry Tuckwell, and Herman Bauman, just to mention a few. Even if these recordings are not available, horn players of all ages have been listening to each other play for years, imitating and avoiding aspects of one another's playing as they went along. When you find other horn players who love to play, you will be in great company. Horn players of all ages and abilities tend to be an exciting and fun group to be with. The most important thing to remember about playing any instrument is that it should be fun. Making the most beautiful sound that you can make each day and every time you play will make it challenging and enjoyable for you and for your audience. Pick music that is challenging and play it until it is fun to play. It takes a tremendous amount of work to develop any skill, especially something as complex and refined as playing a musical instrument. But the benefits are limitless. Playing in a musical ensemble of any size can be a fabulous experience when every individual is committed to playing to their highest potential. It is when this magical potential is achieved that music becomes art. Robert Schumann called the horn the soul of the orchestra. It is a sound that has been a powerful element in the expression of human emotion in music for centuries. Whether heard in the great concert bands or orchestras of the world, or in the small court orchestras of nobility, or in the forest from horseback, or from a distant hillside, it is as unforgettable to listen to as it is to see.